Amen. Hello. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful to be here in this night uh, in a free country where we can openly express our worship and study the Word of God and proclaim the Gospel. Lord, we ask your blessing now in this time as we uh, look in Scripture together and get a better handle on our place in your church and how the gifts of the Spirit work. So we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, a couple of uh, announcements. Number one, uh, what a great Easter we had. How many of you made it out? You came to the Bren Center? That was great. Oh, so at the Bren Center, when the invitation was given, we saw around 220 people come forward to make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? And on all of our campuses on Sunday, we had six services uh, in total, we saw over 800 people come to Christ on Easter. Isn't that great? 800, over 800. So we're still just praising the Lord for that. Uh, I wanted to mention, uh, if you know anybody in the Miami, Florida area, I'll be there next Wednesday night speaking. Uh, Pedro Garcia pastors the Calvary Chapel of Kendall there, so I'm gonna be speaking at their services. They have two services on Wednesday night. So be praying for us, and uh, I'll be back on Thursday, but I'm kind of on a little whirlwind trip of a lot of speaking coming up, so uh, my good friend and yours, Levi Lusco, will be speaking next Thursday night, so that'll be great. And also, I want to ask you to be in prayer for a bunch of our junior high kids. Uh, they're over, junior high and high school, they're over in Haiti right now. We were trying to find a photo. I don't know, there it is, there's a little shot. And uh, look at that, those kids, they're going over there to build and to distribute food and clothing in the name of Jesus Christ. So we're proud of them, and we're just gonna pray for God to bless them over there. Uh, one of them, Taylor, got a little bit dehydrated, so we want to pray for her that they'll all stay very healthy. And one last thing, we'll pray in a moment, but I, we just received word uh, from Nagme Abedini. You know, Nagme is the wife of Saeed Abedini, and uh, he has been incarcerated in an Iranian prison now for over two years, and uh, I can't give you the details of what's happening because I was asked not to, but we need to really be praying for him. You know, in this negotiation with Iran, who I don't think we can trust at all, uh, but I, I would say the first thing that would be on the negotiating table if I were the president would be like, you release all American citizens from your prisons, or your sanctions are coming back big time on you guys. And this, <laughs> this whole deal's off. You know, send Saeed Abedini and the others back. It's just, to me, it's like, let's start there. And uh, uh, but we need to pray for him, and because uh, he he has been suffering in that miserable prison there in that hell hole, uh, and his crime is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, let's pray for him and, and for our kids in Haiti. Father, we remember Saeed right now, and we are just praying for divine intervention. You may work through the president. You may work through another person. You may just do it in some amazing way we haven't thought of, but we're praying, Lord, you'll get him out of that prison. Uh, and back to America again. He's an American citizen. He's a pastor. He loves you. He's been treated cruelly, and we're praying, Lord, for him uh, to be freed from that prison. And we pray for our kids in Haiti right now. We thank you for these young people who want to go serve you in, in a very difficult place, a great sacrifice. They're out there showing the love of Jesus in a tangible way. Protect them, keep them healthy, empower them by your Holy Spirit, and use them for your glory. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've used up all my time with announcements, so good night and God bless. All right. Well, let's grab our Bibles. We're back in our series, Live, Love, Fight in Ephesians. And we're gonna be looking at Ephesians chapter four. So turn there with me if you would. And also, uh, turn to Romans chapter 12 because we're gonna pop over there for a moment. So if you have one of those fancy Bibles with two ribbons, I only have one in this one, you might take that ribbon and put it over there in 
Revelation, excuse me, not Revelation, Romans 12, and of course Ephesians 4. The title of my message tonight is The Gifts That Keep On Giving. Quick question, have you ever received a gift from a person you did not like? Not the person, the gift. Uh, you know, you opened it and you tried to look happy, but you weren't happy at all. You know, it, it's hard when sometimes our parents or our grandparents or aunts and uncles will pick out clothes for us and think we'll like those clothes. And then after they give it to you, they ask, have you worn it yet? And you know, you were just actually washing your car with it, you know? <laughs> or you maybe gave it away. We call it re-gifting, right? Just be very careful when you re-gift that you don't re-gift to the person who gave you the gift in the first place. That's what you call an awkward moment. Uh, but there are things, you know, that people give that we don't really want. I don't know where fruitcakes came from. I don't know why they were ever invented. I have a theory that there's one fruitcake on the face of the earth that we've been redistributing for a thousand years. Uh, I, do, do any of you like to eat fruitcake? Really? Okay. Interesting. I hate, I think it's horrible myself, but, and I think there's only one, because have you ever seen two fruitcakes side by side? Think about it. You haven't, because there's just one, and we just keep re-gifting it over and over again, right? Give said nobody wants. Well, that's why when I give a gift to someone, uh, I always will leave the receipt with it, a gift receipt, and I'll say, here's where I bought it. And I would love it if you would take it back and return it and get whatever you want because I want you to be happy because I don't know if I picked the right thing. And uh, sometimes people will come back and say, how do you like my shoes? Oh, well, they're great. Why do you ask? Well, you bought these for me. Oh, well, good, great. Happy birthday or Merry Christmas or whatever the occasion was. Well, now I want to talk about the gifts that God gives to us. And I'm talking about spiritual gifts. And you need to know that whatever God gives will always be the right gift. You won't want to return it, uh, it because it's really a gift just for you, suited for you, always appropriate. And God personally chose those gifts that he gives to people. And, and sometimes it doesn't make complete sense who he gifts with certain gifts. I mean, for me to be considered a teacher of any kind would be a laugh out loud joke to all those who taught me through elementary, junior high, and high school. I was the worst student ever. Uh, one teacher wrote on my report card, all Greg does all day long is stare out the window and daydream and draw cartoons. And the teacher actually said, he's never going to amount to anything. Okay, thank you for those words of encouragement. <laughs> but uh, it was true. That's what I did. I only had interest in a couple of uh, subjects that I took in school. One of them was art, but, but I just daydreamed my way through a lot of them. And to think that I'm called to be a, a teacher, preacher, is crazy. But, you know, God gets the glory. So, and the way he distributes the gifts, sometimes you'll say, now that makes sense. And then another time you'll say, that doesn't make sense at all. But in the big scheme of things, it always makes sense. But here's the deal. When God gives you a gift or when God gives you gifts, he expects you to use them. And Ephesians chapter four tells us a little bit about the gifts of the Spirit and why the Lord gave them to us. Now, we're going through this great book, and as you recall, it's divided into three sections. Uh, wealth, walk, and warfare. Wealth, walk, and warfare. So section one is the wealth of the believer, the spiritual riches God has put into our heavenly bank account that we can draw upon to live the Christian life. Then there's the walk uh, of the Spirit, the walk uh, that God's called us to be engaged in, and that's the section we're in now. And when we get to Ephesians 6, we'll get to the warfare part. So Paul has gone into great depth to tell us what God has done for us. Now he is effectively telling us what we should do in response to that. And that's why Ephesians 4, 1 starts with the word, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. And remember, I've told you, whenever you see the word therefore, 
always find out what it's there for. And it's always drawing upon what has been previously said. So Paul's told us about the riches we have in Christ now. Here's how it plays out in day-to-day -day living. We're transitioning from positional to practical truth, from doctrine to duty, from creed to conduct, to, from exposition to exhortation, from principle to practice. Now, let's think a little bit about the gifts of the Spirit. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 7. Uh, for this particular section, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. However, he has given to each of us a spiritual gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. So we'll stop there. So our theme is our place in the church. And let me just say at the outset, I thank God for the church. You know, people are quick to criticize the church and put down the church and complain about the church, but there's nothing that this world or culture offers that comes even close to who we are as followers of Jesus and what we can have together. I mean, having this time for Bible study is just fantastic. But the problem is, is sometimes we don't really understand the role of the church or our place in it, and we almost treat church like Going to a movie, you know? Well, what time does the movie start? Oh, it starts at seven. Well, let's get there late because they're just gonna roll a bunch of trailers first and, and you know, and then you kind of, you know, come into the film late and, and then you're, you know, watch the film and then you leave before the credits roll and you're munching on your popcorn and checking your text messages even though they tell you not to do that and all that. So, you know, that's how you go to a movie more or less. And sometimes people bring that same sort of cavalier attitude to church with them. Well, well, we don't need to get there early or even on time because well, they just have, what is it, the warm-up act? Uh, no, listen, worship is not the warm-up act. We're here to glorify God, and worship is an essential part of our time together. And then there's the message, and then there's the application, and so we need to think about church in a different way. It's not a place to just come and hear a message and sing a few songs and say hello to a few friends and go home. It includes that. But it's a family. And every believer needs to be a part of the church for a number of reasons. Number one, you need a pastor. You need someone that is a pastor, a spiritual leader in your life. Number two, you need a place to be spiritually fed. Number three, you need a place to be accountable. And as a part of that, you need a consistent theology. This is the problem with church hopping. When you go from church to church and we go Sunday mornings to this church and Sunday nights to that church and, and then sometimes we, we don't go at all to church and then we'll go to four more churches. No, that isn't a good idea. And you would be surprised to know that most pastors would agree with me on this. If I meet somebody, they'll say, I'm a visitor from this other church, and I'll say, well, that's fantastic. I know your pastor. He's a great guy. God bless you. And I'll encourage them to be involved in their church. I don't want to bring them into this congregation if they're part of another body. What I want to see them do is get involved in a body and engage, because when you don't do that, you miss out on all the church can be. Because listen, it's not all about you. Church is not here to just serve you. We are here to do that. But as you mature and grow, you wanna start serving others. And as we're gonna see, that's part of God's objective. And so we wanna come, and in addition to those other things, we wanna discover and use our spiritual gifts. Now, before we sort of define some gifts of the Spirit, let's contrast them to what we would call talents. You know, different people are born with different talents. 
Uh, some are artistic. Uh, some are musical. Some are, have more of a mechanical mind. Uh, some are great at crunching numbers. Uh, you know, everybody has certain abilities and talents that they're born with. But when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, we're talking about something that is altogether different. This is a gift from heaven that God instills in your life that may not even be related to a natural talent you already had. So this is different than talent. So you want to use your talents for the glory of God too. Look at verse 7. He has given to each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. God is the one who decides what gift or gifts you will have. So God makes that decision. Uh, this is reinforced by what Paul writes in Romans 12, 5. He says, we being many are one body in Christ, every one members one of another. Then he says, having then gifts that are differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. So God's given these gifts, use them. And here's what we want to avoid. Don't be envying somebody else's spiritual gift. Now I know pastors that wish they were rock stars. Uh, I know worship leaders that wish they were pastors. I know uh, evangelists that wish they were pastors and pastors that wish they were evangelists. How about just being thankful for whatever gift God gave to you and developing it and using it for his glory? Years ago, when I was a little kid at Christmas, uh, we got our presents and I was very happy with uh, what I received. I don't even remember what it was, but I was happy at the moment. Until my friend, my uh, little buddy, his nickname was Pip, uh, he got something that I really wanted. It was a plastic skin diver toy. Now understand, this is 60s tech, okay? So we're talking super primitive. Basically, the little back opened up, you put a battery in it, closed it, and switched it on, and put it in the pool, and it sunk to the bottom of the pool, but bubbles came out. I thought this was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I wasn't happy with any of the gifts I received because I wanted Pip's gift. You see, and we can do that same thing in our own life as Christians. Well, I want their gift. I wish I was called to do what they're called to do. No, you're supposed to do what God has called you to do. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, God is the one who distributes these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So it's not for me to pick and choose the gifts I want. That's for the Lord to do. You know, it's interesting. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, Now, brothers, concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant. <laughs> but yet, I think there's more ignorance on this topic than perhaps any other out there. And yet, what we just don't understand how the gifts work. And, and here's one of the reasons that we're resistant to the idea of gifts of the Spirit, because we've seen such crazy abuse of them. It seems like whenever you see somebody weird, and they always seem to be on TV, it's like, what do all the preachers who are weird just decide they must be on TV? It's like we think, well, Greg, aren't you on TV? Yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, these guys, the things they do, it's insane. And, and you know, I'll be flipping the channels and I, on my particular service, I have, there's a little cluster of, I'll call them religious channels. I, I don't know if I'd call them all Christian, but they're religious. And, and you know, you'll flip one and, and the preacher's up there just, receive the Holy Spirit, yea, I say unto thee. You know, and, and people are falling down or, then you'll flip the channel and, and it's a service and, and they're saying the Spirit is really at work and people are rolling around on the ground or, or they're barking like dogs that this was a so-called revival that was supposed to have happened, you know, it, it, where people made animal sounds in church. I'm not making this up. I wish I was. And then you'll flip the channel and it's holy laughter. We're having holy laughter, just laughing. And, and so then we say to a non-believer, don't you want to become a Christian? <laughs> and laugh like a fool and bark like a dog and roll around on the ground? This is awesome. And they say, I don't want to be a Christian. If that's what being a Christian is. 
And more to the point, they'll say, I don't want that if that's what the work of the Holy Spirit is. Okay, news flash. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's just a bunch of weird people doing weird things that have nothing, that has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit of God. So let's find out what the real thing is. Because I think when we recoil from this, we throw out the baby with the bathwater. By the way, did anyone ever throw a baby out with? It's like, honey, where's the baby? I don't, I was just bathing him. Well, I threw the bath water out. Go check. I found him, he's okay. It probably happened once, hence the expression. Um, but because of abuse, we say, I don't want that. But I believe that there are gifts of the Spirit. I believe that they are available for believers today. In fact, 1 Corinthians 1, 7 says, don't come behind in any gift, a literal translation, charismatic endowment, as you wait for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, one position, uh, these folks would call themselves cessationists, would say, we don't believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today, or they might say, we believe certain gifts are for today, like maybe teaching and evangelist, but, but not these other so-called sign gifts or miracles, and, and so we don't need those gifts because we have the Bible, and uh, the Bible's all we need. Well, wait a second, I'm all for the Bible, uh, obviously, but uh, Paul said, don't come behind in any spiritual gift as you wait for the return of Jesus Christ. See, one of the signs of the last days is there would be satanically energized times. So don't you think we need all the power we can get? I think so. So we need to say, all right, Lord, I want those gifts in my life. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, desire spiritual gifts. And the word desire could be translated earnestly want and cultivate. It's vital that we desire these gifts to discover what they are, and if we have them, that we not let them lie dormant, or we might find ourselves quenching the Holy Spirit. In fact, we're told over in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the Spirit, and despise not prophesying. Now the word that is used there for quench means to extinguish. You know, like if we went down to the beach and you had a fire going in the night and it's time to break camp and you pour water on it, put some sand on it, you're extinguishing or quenching the fire. So the idea here is, is God saying, I put this gift in you and I don't want to use you. And you're going, yeah, no, I don't want that gift. I don't want to do that thing for God. That's quenching the Holy Spirit. Okay, with that in mind, uh, God wants his power in your life and we should want it too. Paul mentions four gifts here in verse 11. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. Let's start with apostles. The word apostle means a sent one, or literally one who is sent on a mission. In its primary and most technical sense, the word apostle is used in the New Testament only of the 12 that were called by Jesus. Now, of course, Judas Iscariot disqualified himself for obvious reasons, and so he was replaced by Matthias in the book of Acts, but then along comes the apostle Paul, who though he was not one of the original 12 that walked with Christ, he describes himself as an apostle born out of due time, and he met the requirements of apostleship in that he saw the risen Lord and was chosen by Jesus. Now, these apostles uh, these men of God we read about in the New Testament, when they spoke, it was God's word. When Peter spoke and wrote, that was scripture. When Paul spoke and wrote, it's the word of God. When the apostle John spoke, it's the Bible. So their words were given to them by God. They weren't flawless men. They weren't perfect men, but they were men that God touched and breathed his word into them and through them, and that's what we regard as scripture today. Well, having said that, what about modern day apostles? You know, sometimes people say, I'm an apostle. They'll even introduce themselves as apostle whatever. Hi, I'm apostle so-and-so. And I'm a little nervous about that because I've seen some of these guys and it's almost as though they're saying, I'm the apostle and you cannot question my word. Listen, there is no preacher out there that you should not question, including me. 
uh, because any preacher can misrepresent God. Any preacher can be off theologically. So I encourage you to scrutinize my words. Don't believe it because I said it. Say, well, is that biblical? Does he have a biblical basis for saying that? In fact, they did this even with the Apostle Paul. In Acts 17, 11, we read of the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. They listened eagerly to Paul's message. Listen, they searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. <laughs> now, if they were checking out Paul, shouldn't we be checking out so-called modern-day apostles today? Because here's the problem. The Bible tells us that there will be false apostles in the end times. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 speaks of false apostles, deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. And, and he goes on to say, and I'm not surprised that even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. So uh, there are those that misuse this. Now, that's sort of the negative but let's come back to the positive. I, I don't think there are apostles today on the level of the original 12. No man or woman is gonna speak authoritatively today and that will become scripture and we'll add new sections to our Bible. That's done, that's complete. But you can have an apostolic-like ministry and by that I simply mean you are gifted by God to go plant churches or maybe you're a missionary and you get out there and do a work and you move on and do another work. So that's apostolic in a broad sense. Uh, but that's the apostle. Now we have the prophet, verse 11. Now apostles and prophets are different. Uh, a prophet is not sent on a mission per se. In general, a prophet has a message. Uh, for instance, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, they were all prophets. And in many cases, they predicted the future. So when a prophet, or someone who says they're a prophet, tells us they're speaking for the Lord, here's how we can tell if they're a prophet or not. If what they say happens, hey, maybe they're a prophet. If what they say doesn't happen, they're a false prophet. Deuteronomy 18, 21 says, how will we know if a prophecy is from the Lord? Well, if the prophet speaks in the Lord's name, but his prediction does not happen or come true, you know the Lord did not give him that message. That prophet has spoken without my authority and need not be feared. And again, just like there will be false apostles in the end times, the Bible warns that there will be false prophets as well. Now, having said that, there is a place when God can speak through you. Uh, another translation of the word prophesy means to bubble forth. And there have been times, maybe in your life, I know there have been in mine, where, where the Lord will give me some words that I'd never even considered personally. I'd not prepared those remarks, but they just seem to come from heaven and they go through you and it's so exciting, you want to take notes on yourself. <laughs> but it's really not you. Have you ever had that happen? Maybe someone says, I'm struggling with this, and all of a sudden you just start sharing some things with them, and you're thinking, wow, this is amazing. I didn't come up with this. So the Lord can give you those words, and that would be him speaking through you or bubbling through you and so forth. Uh, but uh, So I believe there can be a ministry today where God does that, but I don't think that we have a prophet in the sense of an Old Testament prophet who predicts the future. Then there are evangelists. And a literal definition of evangelist would be bearers of good news. There are many great evangelists God has raised up historically. Uh, we can go back, of course, to the apostles. Certainly Peter was a gifted evangelist. Paul was a great evangelist. Uh, Philip is uniquely identified in the New Testament as an evangelist and move forward historically in American history. We have George Whitfield, who have preached to thousands of people without a microphone like I have right now. Uh, it was said that people could hear him uh, and when there would be crowds as large as 30,000. Amazing. And then fast forward and you have people like uh, Billy Sunday and Charles Finney and then of course uh, D.L. Moody and pretty much the one we all think of immediately is Billy Graham who has been so gifted by God to be an evangelist. But here's something that you may not know about evangelists. You don't have to be a preacher to be an evangelist. 
Some of the best evangelists I've heard don't have pulpits, they don't hold crusades, they don't do special meetings, they've just been gifted by God to articulate the gospel. An evangelist is a man or a woman that has been given a special gift from God to articulate their faith. And I don't know why some people seem to have this ability more than others, but I just recognize it as a gift. Uh, I'll watch them and I'll say, man, that's, that's the gift. They've got that gift. And when they speak, somehow people get it. They understand it. So this is a very important gift. And I've also found that those who are called as evangelists often have a gift of encouraging the church, exhorting the church. Okay, so finally we have pastor teachers in verse 11. And um, in the original language, this would really be one category. So it's not like pastors and teachers, it's pastor teachers. If you're called to be a pastor, you need to be a teacher. But what is the objective of a pastor? Well, it is to feed the flock of God, the Bible says, and to declare the whole counsel of God. Sometimes I'm, a, I'm asked what I think the greatest need in the church is today. And as I travel around and speak in different churches and so forth, I would say the greatest need in the church today is for clear biblical exposition. I think this is sorely lacking. And I think that we have probably the most biblically illiterate generation of all time right now. Uh, even people that attend church in many cases don't even have a basic working knowledge of scripture and, and of the word of God. And I think that's why it's so important for a pastor teacher to teach the word of God chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And that's so important. And you know, uh, this is what we're commanded by God to do. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4. He says, preach the word. Be prepared. Whether the time is favorable or not, patiently correct, rebuke, encourage your people with good teaching. Why should we do that? Listen, because the time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They'll follow their own desires and they'll look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Here's the way I look at it. I'm not here to entertain you. I am here to just teach God's word to you and make it as understandable as I can and also proclaim the gospel. Uh, I think when someone goes to church, they want the stinking preacher to preach. Just get up there and preach. Don't try to be a stand-up comedian. Don't try to be a psychologist. Don't try to be a social activist. Be a preacher and be thankful God has called you to do it and open the Bible and tell us what the Bible says because I don't care what you think. His opinion isn't any better than anybody else's opinion. But when he opens the word of God, now you have my attention. And that's what we need, I think, in churches today. And people will develop an appetite for what you feed them. And here at Harvest, we offer theology without apology. So when you come to a service, we're gonna open the Bible and we're gonna have a Bible study. And if you don't like that, well, you could change and start liking it and get an appetite for it, that would be the best scenario. So why did God give us the gifts of the Spirit? Look at verse 12. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. See, the role of a pastor teacher is not just to teach people, but it's to train and equip them. Uh, I went and asked one of our associates how many people we have actively involved in service at Harvest. I, I think you'd be surprised to know that for the size of our church, uh, if you take all of our congregation, Riverside and here, it's upwards of 13,000 people. Uh, if you were to take all of our church, you would find our staff is relatively small. Uh, I know churches that are half our size that have twice our staff. And the reason for that is because we're cheap. We don't want to, no, that's not the, no. The reason for that is because what we really look for is training up people to serve the Lord as volunteers in all kinds of areas. You're gonna find something here that you can do for God's glory. Right now we have around 1,500 of our people actively involved in volunteering 
serving the Lord. It can be anything from a trip to Haiti, like we've mentioned, or going to the Fred Jordan mission, or serving as a counselor, serving as an usher, uh, serving as a Sunday school teacher, the list goes on. And I'll tell you what, these are blessed people. That's when a big church becomes a small church, when you get involved. So you wanna find out what your gifts are and start using them. You say, well Greg, how do you figure it out? Sometimes it's as simple as process of elimination. You know what I did when I was a brand new Christian is I volunteered to do everything. And I found out really quickly, wow, I'm really bad at this. I don't think I'll ever do this again. I, and I could give you illustrations, but that would take too long because there's so many. But, um, oh, I'm not gifted here, I'm not gifted there. And so sometimes it's discovering what I'm not called to do that will help me then discover what I am called to do. But just volunteer, I'll help out and we'll do everything we can to train you. Actually, the word that is used here for equipping refers to something being restored to its original condition. You ever see a classic car that's restored to perfection cruising down the road? That's a thing of beauty. I like to call it art on wheels. I go, wow, look at that. My wife says, what, that car? She's like, whatever, but I love it. To me, it's in that fantastic, it's so original. Well, that's what the word here means. It's getting it back to its original condition so it will do what it was originally meant to do. And by the way, the word is a medical term that's used for the setting of bones. And so the idea is find out what God has gifted you to do and then start serving in that capacity. Now there's different gifts that God gives and there's a list of them in Romans 12. That's why I had you turn there. So why don't you pop over to Romans 12 real quick. Let's read verses six to eight. We're gonna come back to Ephesians. By God's grace, he has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. If God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're called as a teacher, teach well. If your gift is encouraging others, be encouraging. If your gift is giving, then give generously. If God has given you a leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. If you have a gift for showing kindness to others, then do it gladly. Stop there. Certain terms sort of bubble up. Do it well, generously, gladly. Take this responsibility seriously. Let's consider a few of those gifts. The gift of exhortation. This is an interesting gift. To exhort here means to motivate, stimulate, and excite, and it also implies correction. So where a teacher will tell you how to do it, someone with the gift of exhortation will make you want to do it. That's an important gift. I don't wanna say it's like being a spiritual cheerleader because that trivializes it a bit, but the idea is, hey, they get in there and say, I see this ability in you and I think you can do this thing and you gotta go out there right now and just take a step of faith and see what will happen and somehow, after their little pep talk, you wanna go out and give it a go. That's a gift of exhortation. So it's motivating, it's stimulating, it's encouraging, sometimes it's also correcting. Paul and Barnabas would visit the churches in Acts chapter 14. It says, they confirmed the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith that we through much tribulation must enter the kingdom of God. So the idea is sometimes in church we're exhorted or we're encouraged because we're down and circumstances are bad, we're having family problems, or we're having financial problems, or we're having health problems, or problems at work, and, and then you come and hear a message, and yes, it's teaching, but there's also an encouragement to press on, an encouragement that God is faithful. We need that, we need people with the gift of exhortation, and you may have that gift. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24 says, let's not consider, excuse me, let us consider one another to provoke each other to love and to good works. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another daily and so much more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. Then we have the gift of giving. Romans 12, eight, if it's giving, then give generously. You say, well, I don't have that gift. I'm not rich enough. 
Did you know you don't have to be rich to have the gift of giving? Uh, first of all, let me just say that every believer should give regularly and faithfully of their finances to the Lord. And I think many believers have not learned this discipline in their life. They, they sort of hang on to their money. This, this is mine, you know. And, you know, God's not going to pry it out of your stingy fingers. But let me just tell you something. God doesn't ask for your money because he needs your money. God asks you to give in that area because he knows often that is an indication of the real level of your commitment. Uh, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And Jesus also said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Now when we're kids, we think it's more blessed to receive than it is to give, right? Christmas is all about, what am I getting? But as you get a little older and a little more mature, you start discovering the joy of giving, don't you? And what a joy it is. And, and so every believer should give. In fact, very interesting passage in Malachi 3.10. God says, you've robbed me. I mean, can you imagine going to a, to a church and robbing it, you know, taking the money out of the offering, running? I mean, that's obviously wrong. But God says, you've robbed me. The people say, well, how have we robbed you? God says, in your tithes and offerings. He says, so bring your tithes and offerings to me so there'll be food in my temple. Listen to this. If you do, I'll open the windows of heaven and I'll pour you out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to take it in. Try it, the Lord says. Put me to the test. But many have never put God to the test in this sense. They've never given to the Lord and they're missing out. Did you know that most studies show that 10 to 20% of the people in a congregation give regularly of their finances? 10 to 20%. You think everybody gives? Don't even think, don't, never. <laughs> it's 10 to 20%. 10 to 20% of the faithful people carry the freight for the whole thing. Thank God for the 10 to 20%. But man, it sure is a sad thing that that 80% or 90% miss out. And actually we're told in scripture that when we come together to worship the Lord, we should always bring our offering, 1 Corinthians 6, 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up. So the offering should not come as a surprise to you. You know, where people are like, oh, what is this mysterious bag passing by? <laughs> you should have already figured that out. You should have already determined when you came in, here's my check I'm gonna give, or I'm gonna do it electronically. However you do it, you do it. I'm already prepared for it. And then you have the joy of it. But there's a specific gift of giving here. A specific gift. I've met people that have very little that are so generous, it's mind-blowing. And I've met people that are very well off financially that are so stingy, it's mind-blowing. Well, Greg, that's how they got rich. Yeah, maybe. But boy, they're sure missing out on a blessing. But I've seen people that will just give what God has given, and I see how the Lord blesses them. Maybe you have that gift. Then there is also the gift of showing mercy and kindness. Verse eight. And you that have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. There are people that have an extraordinary, supernatural ability from God to show mercy and compassion and kindness to those in need. I've, I've seen them. I've seen them in hospitals. I've seen them in convalescent homes. I've seen them on the streets. I, I've seen them do things that blow my mind. I think that is a gift from God. There's just something about them that brings comfort and help to people who are in need. I mean, if, you know, if you're in a hospital and you're not feeling well and, and you need some ministry, I don't know that you necessarily need a pastor teacher. I mean, he'll come in with his pulpit on wheels and give you a sermon. That'd be okay, I guess, but... Probably someone with a gift of mercy would do a lot of good for you. Someone just hold your hand. Say, I'm really sorry you're going through this. I love you. Let's pray. Anything you want to say, and there's something about them that just draws you out. That's a gift from God. You may have that gift. See, what I'm trying to explain to you is preaching is not the only gift out there. There's all these gifts that God gives, and one isn't better than another. One isn't more important than another. They're just different from one another. So what are your gifts? 
Have you discovered them yet? And if you've discovered them, are you using them? Why does God give us the gifts of the Spirit? Look at verse 15 now of Ephesians 4, back there. Back to Ephesians 4. Speaking the truth in love, that you may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every joint supplying, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. See, we all have a part to play. Everybody matters. And why? Why is God given the gifts of the Spirit? Verse 15, so we may grow up. Grow up. You know, when we start out as Christians, we're like babies. You know, it's cute for a baby to be a baby, isn't it? I love babies. Their skin is so smooth. And you look at their faces and, and everything they do is entertaining to you, if you're the parent or grandparent. Of course, everybody thinks they have the most beautiful child ever. And sometimes you look at someone's child and you go, oh, wow. I need the gift of mercy, I think. I don't. But, you know, if it's your baby or if it's your grandchild, they're the funniest, they're the smartest, they're the most beautiful, they're the most handsome, at least I think so, about my kids. But, you know, everything they do is entertaining. Oh, look, they smiled. Oh, oh look, they, they coughed. Oh, oh look, they, 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 they're really smiling. Well, they're, you, know what's, you know why, don't you? You know that they get older and... They start doing things on their own a little bit. First time they try to feed themselves and most of the bites miss and they're in their face and it's, there's more food on the floor and there is on the plate, you know, and, and so you're trying to help them and you're bringing the food in if they don't like what you're offering. So you make the airplane sound, right? Okay, here it comes. Open it. You know, the way I've always got my kids to finish the meal is I'll say, okay, you take three monster bites and I'll give you dessert. Monster bites are big Bites. Oh, that's not a monster bite. Take a monster bite. So, you know, that, that's cute when they're little. But if they're 22 years old and you're still saying take monster bites, <laughs> it's not cute. It's sad. A big baby. Maybe the only thing worse than a big baby is a big rabbit. I was uh, going through a, a newspaper the other day and there was a picture of a rabbit that's the largest rabbit Alive today. You want to see the picture? You do, don't you? Look at the screen. I'm not making this up. This is me. There it is. Now, look at that lady. It's an adult woman. That is a rabbit. Look at the size of the ear. That is gross. That's not cute. She says she spends a lot of money feeding it carrots. Yeah, we're good with that. I just woke up somebody. I don't know. It's inappropriately big. And that's how it can be with some Christians. You know, they're acting like big babies still. Time to grow up. That's why God gives us the gifts of the Spirit. That's why he wants us to get involved in the church. In his first epistle, epi not epistle. <laughs> not sure what an epistle is. In his first epistle, uh, John addresses little children, young men, and fathers. And that's what happens. You start out as a little child. Then you become a young man in the faith. And then you become a father in the faith. Now your job is to hand it on to the next generation. So what do we know about kids? Number one, we know little children are fickle. You know, a child can go from laughing to crying in a millisecond. It's amazing. Uh, they can be totally happy and completely miserable it just, one little thing will change it. Usually if someone takes their toy or turns off the iPad or whatever it is that's entertaining them, they go from happiness to misery. Young believers can be this way too. You know, they're, they're still babies in the faith and they're emotionally unstable. They have high highs and low lows and they can change your opinions very quickly. They're influenced by the last preacher they heard or the last book they read. They don't have a consistent theology yet and, and they're unstable. And this is why we're told that we need to 
be in the church, hearing the word of God, developing our gifts, developing a consistent theology so we'll no longer be like children. Number two, if a baby or a child is hungry, they want it now. You know, the problem with babies is they can't talk yet. So you have to figure it out. What's, why are you crying, baby? What's wrong? And, and sometimes it's as simple as they're hungry or they want their diaper changed. And so you have to work through it. Then they get older and they start communicating with you. Well, sometimes we have believers. They're, they're just hungry. They want something now. And you need to grow up past that. You need to mature beyond that. Another trait of young children is they love exciting new things. You can have a child playing with their favorite toy. They love that toy above all other toys. And then a commercial comes on TV for some other new toy. And it's like that toy they're holding. It's just like, <laughs> ah! <laughs> they want that now. And then you'll go get that for them for their birthday and they'll change their mind in the next, next two weeks and they don't want it anymore. You know how kids can be. Well, we can be that way too sometimes. People sometimes want new things. They want novelty. Uh, they, they want gimmicks. And they, tired of, they tire of the word of God. And so I think that we want to grow past that. Now look, it's one thing if you're six months old in your faith. It's one thing if you're under a year. But when you've known the Lord for five years, 10 years, and you're still acting like a baby, here's my two words for you. Grow up. It's time to grow up. Hebrews 5.12 says, you've been Christians a long time now. You ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you the basic things a beginner must learn about the scriptures. You're like babies who only drink milk and can't eat solid food. We need to grow up. Here's a couple things as we wrap this up that I think a, a child must realize about themselves. First of all, just realize they're a kid. <laughs> you know, if, if you're young in the faith, there's nothing wrong with that. You need to continue to grow and you need to be around mature Christians that will help you grow spiritually. Um, we watch a show on television called Chopped. Have you ever seen that? It's on the Food Channel. And they bring these chefs in. They give them a basket with mystery foods. And, and they have to make up an appetizer, a main course, and then a dessert. And uh, as they work through the original four, they end up with one person who's the champion. And they win a cash prize. And the others are chopped after the judges try out the food. Uh, and so they're asked what they'll do with the cash prize. And some will say, well, you know, I want to help my mother. She's, you know, I want to give this to my mother or I want to do, you know. They'll always say something really wonderful. And, and so the judges will hopefully let them win, you know. And so uh, I don't know why, but some of my grandkids like to play chop. Papa, they say, let's play chop. And so we get out all this fake food. We have this wooden pizza and this little plastic vegetables. And, and so I say, okay, here's your ingredients. Start now. And so they make their thing. And I say, okay, you have 10 seconds, five seconds. Your time is up. What did you make? And then I went through this with them. And then Riley, my oldest granddaughter, I said, okay, Riley, you're going to get a cash prize of $100. What do you want to do with it? She said, I'm just a kid, so I want to buy a toy. I thought, that's a great answer. A kid needs to know they're a kid. If you're a young Christian, know that about yourself and hang around people that are more mature in the faith than you are. Number two, as a child, know you're vulnerable. <laughs> know you're vulnerable. And know that about younger Christians. They're vulnerable. 800 people made a profession of faith last Sunday. I mentioned that. You might know one of those people. I'm telling you right now, if you do, you find that person, you get them with you, you start spending some time with them, you have some personal Bible study with them, you pray for them, you bring them to church with you, and you get them integrated into the church as quickly as you can so they don't fall through the cracks because they're vulnerable. And verse 14 says, they're immature, tossed and blown about by every wind of teaching. You know, there's a devil and he's just prowling about seeking whom he may devour. So we have to be so careful and we want to do everything to protect these brand new believers who are so loved by God. But listen, if we've known the Lord for a time, it's time to get out of diapers. It's time to lose the pacifier. 
It's time to start digging into scripture for yourself and finding what your spiritual gifts are, developing and using them. Find your place in the church and it will change your entire worship experience. Stop coming as a spectator and start coming as a participator. Become a part of the family of God. How does that sound? Do it. You'll be glad you did. Well, <laughs> there might be some of you that are a visitor tonight and you kind of feel like you walked in on one of those family discussions. You ever done that before? Go over to your friend's house, you randomly knock on the door, they didn't know you're coming in. You walk in and they're all around the table, very serious. Oh, we're having a family discussion. You're like family, why don't you join us? No, thank you. <laughs> don't like tension. Well, you came into a family discussion and here's the deal. We want you to join our family. This is the family of God. We're not perfect. We're not flawless. But we're the best thing going. <laughs> There's nothing like it anywhere else. We're the church. And we, are established, we were established by Jesus Christ. That's who our founder is. That's who our Lord is. The church is like an oasis of hope and a desert of hopelessness. And we're here for you. And we want you to join the family. You say, well, how, you, how do you get in this family? You have to be born into it. Oh, you mean like raised in a Christian home? No, no. You have to be born again into it. And Jesus said, you must be born again. Or another way to put it, born all over again or, or born from above. And it means that there has to come a moment in your life where you say, I know I'm a sinner and I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin and I'm ready to turn from my sin and believe in him. And when you take that step of faith, you can be forgiven of your sin and be a bona fide functioning member of God's family. The Bible says, for as many as received him, he gave them the power to become sons of God. So have you received him yet? Uh, it's not enough to just have a Bible. It's not enough to come from a Christian family. There has to be that moment where you've asked Jesus to come into your life. Have you done that yet? If not, would you like to? We're gonna close in prayer. And if there's anybody that wants to ask Christ to come into your life or maybe you've slipped away spiritually and you wanna make a recommitment tonight, we would welcome you as you do that. And we're gonna give you that opportunity as we close now in prayer. Everybody praying, Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for your love for us. And we pray now for any here that do not yet know you. Lord, help them to see their need for Jesus. We pray that your Holy Spirit will convict and convince them of their sin and their need for forgiveness and help them to believe in you now, we would ask. Now when our heads are bowed, and our eyes are closed and we're praying together. How many of you would say tonight, Greg, I want my sin forgiven. I wanna know that when I die, I will go to heaven. I want Jesus Christ to come into my life and be my savior and my Lord, pray for me. If that's your desire, if you want Jesus to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want your guilt taken away, if you wanna to go to heaven when you die, would you raise your hand up right now wherever you are and I'll pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. Raise your hand up high where I can see it, please. God bless you. God bless you there in the back corner. Anybody else? You want his forgiveness tonight. You wanna to join God's family. Let me pray for you. Raise your hand up. God bless you. If you haven't raised your hand yet, lift it now. There in the back, God bless you too. God bless you also. Anybody else? Raise your hand up right now. Let me pray for you. God bless you. One final moment. You want Christ to come into your life. Raise your hand up. I'll pray for you. God bless. Well, our heads are still bowed. Maybe some of you would say, hey, I've, I've fallen away. I, I'm, I am a Christian, but I certainly have not been a part of his church, and I've been doing things I know are wrong. I've been living a compromised life, and I want to recommit my life to Jesus tonight. Would you pray for me? If that's your desire, why don't you raise your hand up and let me pray for you right now. You want to come back to Christ. Let me pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand up now. I'll pray for you. God bless. Lord, I thank you now for each one of these and I pray you'll help them to take that next step 
and that they'll just begin to follow you. Now, while our heads are still bowed, I'm gonna ask every one of you that just raise your hand, saying that you wanted Jesus in your life, I want you to stand to your feet, wherever you are, stand up. Stand up right there at your seat, and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. Then you heard me right, stand up. Others are standing. Are you one of them? Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you wanna make this commitment, a recommitment to Christ. Stand to your feet right now, wherever you are. God bless you guys that are standing. Anybody else, stand up. There's a few more of you that raised your hand. Stand up now. If you really wanna do this, this is the next step. Just stand up, and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. Even if you did not raise your hand, you wanna make this commitment to Jesus. You want your sin forgiven, or you wanna come back to the Lord. Let me lead you in a prayer. Stand to your feet. Anybody else? God bless you. One final moment. Anybody else? Stand now. Anybody else? Stand now. God bless you guys standing. All right, now you that are standing, I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. And this is where you're asking God to forgive you of your sin. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud right where you stand, okay? Pray this out loud after me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I know that you're a savior who died on the cross for all my sins and rose again from the dead I turn from my sin now. I choose to follow you from this night forward. I want to be a part of your family. Thank you for loving me and accepting me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you guys that prayed that prayer. God bless all of you. All right. Well, God bless you. Listen, thank you, Chad. Uh, we have a Bible for every one of you that just prayed that prayer with me. This is the New Testament with some notes that I wrote. It's called the Start Bible. Kind of like the idea of you're in a race and the starter pistol, pistol fires. Uh, I'm not sure what a pistol is um, <laughs> or an official. Uh, but we want to give you the Start Bible to get you started on the right foot that you can take home and start reading tonight. We also have some folks standing by that want to talk with you a little about this commitment or recommitment you've made. So if you would, please, in fact, let's all stand up, if you would, everybody standing. You that stood and prayed their prayer with me, would you leave your seat right now and head over here to the corner? You see there's one of our counselors, Chad. He's holding the Bible up. Go over there to that side room. We're going to give you the start Bible. So all of you that prayed that prayer, just go over there into this side room. Get your start Bible. Again, you prayed that prayer with me, go over there right now, and we'll give you this Bible and get you going in the right direction. God bless you guys, amen. God bless you. Uh, if, if you would prefer it, we'll dismiss you in a moment. You can walk over there as we're dismissed. Just go on in that room, say, hey, I prayed that prayer and I want that Bible, and we'll encourage you as well. So let's pray. Now, Lord, we've heard your word, and we want to do what you're telling us to do, not just think about it. We want to act on it. You've told us to not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer. So, Lord, help us to discover those gifts. And those gifts from the Holy Spirit come as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. So would you empower us right now? I'll tell you what, I'm gonna lead you guys in a prayer. And if you would like to, I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. And this is where you are praying for the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So as I pray, you pray this out loud right where you're standing, all of you that want to. Pray this, Lord Jesus, I want all the power you have for me. I want all the gifts you have for me. So would you fill me with the Holy Spirit right now? Would you help me discover my spiritual gifts and use them for your glory? In Jesus' name I pray. Oh, Father, you heard those prayers. And I pray that you'll bless everyone that prayed that. Help this prayer to be answered, help these gifts to be discovered, developed, and fanned into full flame as we find our place in your church. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.